I mean, you, this, you can take this to the bank if you care about lost people and getting the only message that can save them into eternal life, that's the message of the gospel. If you're intentional about that, mark this down. You are going to face trouble and not a mere bit of it. You're going to face a lot of trouble. The more intentional you are about sharing the gospel with lost people, you can mark this down. You are going to have a bullseye on your back. How do you think I would know that? Several ways I know it. From scripture. <laughs> That's the main way I know it. But also, I consider myself a fisher of men. I care about lost people and I try to reach them wherever I go. And because of that, I go through lots and lots and lots of trouble. Do you hear me this morning saying y'all to pray for your pastor? Y'all to pray for Freddie. I know what Freddie does. He gives the gospel wherever he goes. That man has been through a lot of trouble. When I came here to Northside, Yankee was faithful to give the gospel clear when I came here. And I'm so thankful for that man. That he, he stood in the gap. He suffered a lot of trouble. Target on his back. But you notice one thing I've noticed about these giants of the faith? I consider them that. And I'm not doing like Paul did to the Corinthians, giving glory to man. I give glory to the Lord for this. But they've never shut their mouth. Through all the trouble they've been through, they've never shut their mouth in giving the gospel. And I admire them for that. But I tell you one thing, if you share the gospel of grace, you're going to have a target on your back. You're going to go through a lot of trouble. Because Satan, he hates, he hates, he hates, he hates the message of the gospel of grace. Why do you think he fights so hard to give a message of works to lost people, to confuse them, to think they have to do works in order to be saved into eternal life? Because he hates the message of grace. He hates it. He does not want that message, the gospel of grace, to reach a lost man. Satan wants to take as many lost people to hell to, with him, to that lake of fire with him, as he possibly can. And so you know what he does? He's going to use any and all means necessary to try to do something. A lot of things, but he's going to do, use any means necessary to try to shut the mouth of a fisher of men. He's going to try to shut that man down by feeding him a lot of trouble, hoping that all the trouble that he feeds that fisher of men will silence his mouth. Get him to quit. Throw in the towel. It ain't worth me sharing the gospel to lost people because look at all the trouble that I'm facing. This was a very deep concern of Paul in the Bible for the Thessalon Thessalonican believers. That's hard to say. The Thessalonican believers. This was a deep concern for Paul concerning them. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul was very concerned that all the trouble these believers in Thessalonica were going to go through for the sake of sharing the gospel, he was afraid or concerned, deeply concerned, that it was going to shut their mouth. So let's pick it up in verse 5. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Reckon why he used the words, our gospel? You know, that's a precious phrase to me. Because you know what's cool? As some of the young people would probably say, cool beans. You know what's cool beans? Is this. When I can say our gospel, it's the gospel of Christ, right? Well, why did he say our gospel? Because it came from their mouth. It came from their mouth. I want the gospel to come from my mouth. I want to be able to say like Paul, our gospel, because it came from my mouth. See, if you really care about lost souls, if you really care, you'll share right? If you really care, 
you'll share. Real friends tell. Now, your sharing may, may not be by word of mouth. It may be by supporting a ministry so that other people... I know a guy, a good friend of mine now, he says he works at a job all the time and he's got long hours, but he says, John, I can't get out like you do and share the gospel to a lot of people by word of mouth, but he says I can support it financially. So he's reaching souls, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't say I care about lost people and sits there and does nothing. Well, the way he can reach lost people is by financially supporting people who can, by word of mouth, say it. How is other ways that we can share the gospel? Can we pray for lost souls? Yeah, there's a lot of ways to share the gospel. But a, a precious way is Paul says it came from our mouth, our gospel. It came from our mouth. That's the cool. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. When you give the gospel to a person, do you want him to walk away as lost as when he came in the door? <laughs> no, you want him to have assurance when he walks away. Oh, I got it. I understand. The one thing that it takes to have eternal life is believe that Christ died for me. Trust him. They gave it in much assurance. They didn't give confusing messages, telling a person he's got to turn from his sins to be saved or telling a person he's got to walk an aisle or telling a person cute little phrases like ask Jesus into your heart that nobody understands what that really means and confuses people. They told him, Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. Believe in him. You have eternal life. They're, the gospel, the way they communicated it, gave people much assurance. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now watch this now. And it says, verse 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word, talking about the word of the gospel, in much affliction. These people were going to be hated Hopefully I won't forget to show you a verse where they were hated because they trusted in Christ. They trusted in that message of the gospel of grace. They were going to go through a lot of trouble for trusting, receiving this message of the gospel of grace, for trusting Christ. He said, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now watch this. The, the, the believers in Thessalonica were so jacked up about the gospel. They were so filled with joy about the gospel. In spite of the trouble they were going through, they were so jacked up about the gospel that they just couldn't be quiet about it. I mean, they let the message fly everywhere. Look what it says. For from you sounded out... The word of the Lord, talking about the gospel, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is, what's the next two words? Spread abroad. The Thessalonican believers were so jacked up about the gospel, man, they spread it everywhere in that region. Everywhere. That's a good thing. So that we, Paul said, we... Paul and Silvanus at Silas and Timotheus. That's who he's talking about, verse 1. So that we, Paul and Silas and Timotheus, we need not to speak anything. Why? Because these believers were so jacked up about the gospel, they then went and told everybody else the gospel there. Do you think that kept Paul from still giving the gospel? <laughs> not on your life. <laughs> uh-uh. We keep giving the gospel here no matter how many times people have heard it. We keep giving it. Because you never can tell. There might just be one person that you don't recognize in the crowd that hasn't trusted in Christ. Should we ever assume that everybody's always trusted Christ? No. We keep giving the gospel. Keep giving it. So Paul didn't stop giving the gospel just because they spread it everywhere. I guarantee you he still gave the gospel. But he was so proud of them because they were so jacked up by the gospel that they showed that they cared because they shared. But what is going to be Paul's concern? Well, look at verse 14, chapter 2. 
It says, For ye, brethren, talking about the believers in Thessalonica, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye, believers in Thessalonica, also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. Are they, are they suffering for serving the Lord by being sharers of the gospel? Are they suffering for it? Yeah, they're suffering by their own countrymen. He says, even as they have of the Jews. Who's they? The churches in Judea. They're suffering of their own countrymen, of the Jews. Look how the Jews are treating the believers in Judea. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have, not, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Look at what these, these people in Judea who hate Christ, who hate the gospel, who hate grace are doing. Uh, uh, the Jews, excuse me, the Jews are doing to the churches, the believers in Judea. What these unbelieving, ungodly Jews are doing because they hate Christ, they hate the gospel, they hate the message of grace. Does that sound a little bit familiar to what we've been teaching in Hebrews? It says, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to what? Sp speak. What you think they're that they're so much they're so uh, raged against. What's the message? Why? What do they not want them to speak? The gospel, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. How do you know it's the gospel? That they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Do you think? Do you think when you are intentional about being a fisher of men, about sharing the gospel with lost people, whether it be Jew or Gentile, do you think you're going to get a target on the back? Just ask the Thessalonican believers. Just ask Paul and Silvanus, Silas and Timothy. But watch verse 17. But he says, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. I got that circled in my Bible. You know, I'm so thankful it didn't say Satan stopped us. What is Satan trying to stop? He's trying to stop the mouth of a believer who's given the gospel. He, that's his goal. He wants to shut the mouth of a believer from sharing the gospel. But Paul says, Satan couldn't stop us. He didn't stop us. Paul and Timoth Timotheus and Silas were unstoppable in sharing the gospel. Despite of all the trouble that they're going to go through, and we're going to see this in a little bit. But he didn't say Satan stopped us. Don't let all the trouble that comes your way, whether it be by Satan sending it to you or whether it be by ungodly men like these ungodly Jews who rejected grace, holding on white knuckle fists to the law, whether it be Satan or whether it be ungodly men, don't let anybody shut your mouth. You know what this reminds me of? When I was in Florida, I think Trent, Trent was probably with me at this ball game down there when I was in Bible college. Every Friday night, we'd go soul winning. Every Friday night. Well, we would, this was football season. We went to a football game. And I was out there giving the gospel just like Trent and the other Bible college students were doing. And after a while of sharing the gospel, had kids trust in Christ as their Savior, a law enforcement officer came to me and says, Hey, you got to stop doing that out here. So I looked at him and I said, very respectfully, I said, stop doing what? He never did answer me. I was like, stop doing what? He wouldn't answer me. He said, you just need to stop doing that. I said, stop doing what? Stop doing that. I said, what? I said, he wouldn't answer me, so I said, 
So I said, I looked at everybody. I said, what, talking? I said, what is everybody out here doing? Still, he wouldn't answer me. I said, talking. <laughs> everybody out here is doing the same thing that you're telling me not to do. They're talking. I'm doing the same thing they are. You cannot tell me to leave. He was wanting me to leave. You can't tell me to leave because I'm doing the same thing they're doing. I'm talking. So you know how he got me? You know the little tracts that we give out? He said, you can't give them out. He said, you've got to stop doing that. So I conceded on that because I still wanted to be out there giving the gospel, right? They call that soliciting nowadays. I guess they don't call the selling all them tickets at the door was soliciting. Was it? <laughs> but no, you can't give out something that tells a person how to have eternal life go to heaven, the best thing going. Right? Football's going to fade away, but eternal life doesn't fade away, does it? But he told me I had to stop talking. I said, I'm not going to, because that's what everybody else is doing. So I went right over. He didn't stop me. I went right over to talking to people. But you know what this was? Somebody probably didn't like me giving the gospel out there and went and ported that law in the office. And so what are you going to do? He's going to tell me I have to leave. Well, I put it to the test. It's going to have to take a lot more than that to stop my mouth. But Satan, that's just a work of Satan, y'all. That's just a work of evil men. Wants to stop your mouth. Don't let anything stop your mouth. Paul didn't let anything stop his mouth. Satan will hinder you. You better know that. But he's trying to stop you. But what will you let him do? Paul said, we ain't going to let him stop us. Now look, now Paul has a concern, right? What is his concern? Well, let's keep reading. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear. In other words, there's something weighing heavy on Paul. Paul is deeply concerned about something. He's concerned that these Thessalonican believers, they'll stop some, the trouble they're going through whether it be from Satan or whether it be from ungodly men, will stop their mouth. That's what he's concerned about. He said, when we can no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer, laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions. Mark it down. If you're intentional about sharing the gospel, you are going to go through afflictions. You're going to go through trouble and lots of it. You've got a target on your back. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we, that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Paul told them, you know that we're going to go through trouble, Paul and Silas and Timothy, and you know you are too when you share the gospel. This is not something that the Thessalonican believers didn't know. He said, you know it as it came to pass, you know. For this cause... What cause? Because you're going to go through tribulation. Anybody that shares the gospel, that, that it means something to them, that it's a hill to die for, that the clarity of it means is a hill to die for, that sharing it is a hill to die for, that lost souls are a hill to die for. If you're intentional about it, you're going to go through tribulation. For this cause... When I could no longer forbear, he said, I can't stand, I got to know, I got to know if the trouble you're going through is shut your mouth. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means, remember what I said earlier? The devil will use any means he can to shut a fisher of man, men's mouth. Lest by any means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But... Now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. What did he find out? He got good news back, right? They ain't shut their mouth. They ain't shut their mouth about the gospel. 
and they're still following, serving the Lord faithfully, right? Do you notice that word from this morning that was used? Hmm. Your faith in charity? Hmm. No, nothing had moved their faith. And they had charity on top of that. And they had good remembrance of Paul and Timothy and Silas. You ought to always remember those who led you to, the God, led you to Christ. You know that? Don't ever forget them. And you ought to always pray for a faithful fisher of men. I ought to always do that. You heard me say this morning, please pray for me. Please pray for me. Got a target on my back because I try to lead people to Christ. I'm not patting myself on the back, y'all. I'm not. But I know where I walk and what I do. Freddie has a target on his back. Yankee. Men like that who, are, who have years spent their life for the sake of the gospel, for Christ and the sake of the gospel. They need prayer. They need prayer. We need to pray for one another because I'm hoping I'm speaking to soul winners out here, right? You care. You share. We need to pray for one another because you've got a target on your back. Well, Paul said Timotheus and Silas and Paul, these Thessalonica believers, they had remembrance and they remembered them. They prayed for them. Therefore, brethren, verse 7, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Y'all know something that's discouraging, that can be very discouraging? When you're out there giving the gospel and you're going through a lot of trouble because of it, you got that bullseye on your back. You know what can be really discouraging? You need to see other people in the fight with you. You need to see other people giving the gospel, though they're going through a lot of trouble, but that something, Nothing can stop their mouth. What's really discouraging is when a fisher of men lets trouble stop his mouth, and you see that. Do you think that affects other fishers of men? It does. It does. He said, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. The trouble they, they were going through could not move them in their faith. They still were faithful in giving the gospel and they were still faithful in walking worthy of the Lord as chapter one, uh, chapter 2 talks about how Paul taught them not only the gospel but how to walk worthy of the Lord. And so he they were so thankful for that. Paul and Silas and Timothy. Now, let's stop there and let's go to uh, 1 Timothy. Or maybe it's 2 Timothy. I think it's 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. And look at chapter 2, chapter 2. You know, Paul had a talk with Timothy about going through trouble, about going through hardness. He had this same talk with Timothy, the same concern for Timothy. And he told Timothy, Timothy, you're going to go through hard times for the sake of the gospel, but don't let anything shut your mouth. Don't let anything cause you to quit. To quit. So let's begin in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Thou therefore, my son, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now the context here is, he's telling Timothy, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Don't ever quit. That's the context here. Don't quit. Let me ask you something. Is God's grace only strong enough to save us into eternal life? Is that all it's good for? Mm -mm. God's grace not only can save us into eternal life, but it can keep us saved into eternal life, right? It's what does keep us saved into eternal life. But it goes even beyond that. It not only saves us, it not only keeps us saved, it teaches us how to live, doesn't it? Right? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. So it teaches us how to live. But it doesn't stop there. God's grace is the thing that gives us strength when we're going through hard times. I want to pull up a song for y'all. I hope I can do it on this phone real quickly. One of my favorite songs is this. 
Watch here. Oh, I just deleted it. <laughs> Watch here. No worries, y'all. I'm getting better at this. Have you heard the song, He Giveth More Grace? I want you to hear the words to this. Watch this. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Because God's grace doesn't diminish when we're going through hard times, does it? It, it, in fact, I think it gets stronger. God gives more grace to us, more grace when we're going through hard times. So be strong in that grace. There's, here's the words. Listen to them carefully now. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. His love has no limit. Well, it's all I can do not to sing this song. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his riches, infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Did you notice that first stanza? He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy to multiply trials is multiply peace. That's why Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, God's grace not only is good enough to save you, it's not only enough to keep you saved, not only enough to teach you how to live, but it will get you through hard times. The, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Does that include hard times? Mm-hmm even more so in hard times. So he tells Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus because it's that grace that's going to get you through the hard times. Skip, skip, verse 3, he says, Thou therefore, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Mark it down. You're going to go through hardness. You're going to go through a lot of it for being a fisher of men. And he's telling Timothy, don't quit. Don't ever quit. Never quit. And he keeps harping on this. Verse 4, he says, excuse me, verse 5. No, I'm skipping sorry. Verse 4, no man that warreth, he's going to use a soldier here. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What happens if a soldier goes AWOL? What happens if he quits? Does he come home with medals? No. He's going to forfeit medals if he quits, right? Who wants to send a soldier into battle who's going to quit? Look at verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. What's he talking about? An Olympic marathon runner he's, he's, he's relating this to an Olympic runner if an Olympic runner quits is he going to wear back in that in Greek times was, is he going to wear the laurel no in, in modern times is he going to wear the gold medal is there going to be any remote chance of that if he quits or any, a silver medal or a bronze no if he quits Look at verse 6. It says, The husband that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. If a farmer, a husband, a vine dresser, if he quits when things get hard, or he doesn't get any rain, or a storm comes, messes his vineyard up, does he just quit, throw his hands up and quit? When, when the going gets rough, does an Olympic runner quit when things get hard? Does a soldier quit when it gets hard? No. If a if a 
farmer quits when it gets hard, will he ever have any fruit? No, he doesn't get, he's not, it won't be first partaker of the fruit. He won't get any because he quit. And then he told Timothy in verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. What is pa Timothy to consider that Paul is saying? He's say Here's what he's to consider, y'all. Don't quit just because things get hard. Don't quit just because you encounter trouble. Don't quit. A lot of fishers of men have quit sharing the gospel. You know why? Because of trouble. They got tired of all the trouble. They got tired of that target on the back. So they quit. They quit sharing the gospel. Paul doesn't want Timothy to quit. So look what he says. Skip, skip to chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, But thou, Timothy, hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. Do you see some hardness mixed in with this kind of stuff? Do you see some trouble along the way? He uses the word long-suffering. <laughs> that means you're having to suffer long, <laughs> right? There's some hardness. What about patience? Patience is the glue that holds you together in a problem. He's... Do you think Paul has faced a lot of problems? Mm-hmm, lots of trouble. Otherwise, you don't need patience. Look at the words he uses, persecutions. Look at the next word, afflictions. Which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. Paul went through a lot of trouble, but watch what his conclusion is. But out of them all, out of all the persecutions and afflictions that came to him at Antioch, Iconium, and in Lystra, he said, I, I quit. Is that what he said? No, he said, I endured. I endured it. Nothing stopped me. Nothing stopped me. And nothing could shut my mouth. He said, I endured. So what is he trying to tell Paul to do? Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Let's see. I got to tracking this little phrase down, the persecution and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. Do you want to see what he went through? You, do you want to see what Paul went through for being a fisher of men? Do you want to see what Paul went through because he was faithful to share the gospel? He went through a lot of trouble, but it couldn't stop his mouth. This is beautiful, y'all. Turn in your Bibles to Acts. Hold your place in 2 Timothy now. We're going to come back there, but look in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Do you think Paul wants him to know what he went through in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? Yep, he does. But see, we've got to do some good Bible study to know what he went through. And he went through this for one reason, y'all, because he shared the gospel. Because of that message, look at all the trouble Paul went through. Do you think... Believers need to know this today. You need to know this. You know, I never t had anybody tell me if I share the gospel, I had no clue what tr <laughs> the amount of trouble I was going to face for being faithful for sharing the gospel. I had no clue. Because if I probably had known it, I would have quit. I was like, no, no thanks, that's not for me. I probably would have quit as a, a young believer learning first learning how to give the gospel, if I'd have known all the trouble that I was going through. Little did I know. But let's pick it up now. Look at chapter Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, now who is they? They, would. you'd have to go back and look at verse, um, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent Barnabas and Saul away, Paul, away. Okay? But also somebody else was with them for a little while. John Mark was with them, but he left. We, we find that out in uh, verse 13. 
Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, this is John Mark, if you want to know how you know that, well, just look at chapter 12, verse 25. It says, John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. So now pick it back up in verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, talking about Barnabas and Saul, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. Now you've got to remember there's two Antiochs. This is Antioch in Pisidia. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if, if ye have any word of, of exhortation for the people, say on. So what do you think Paul's going to do there? He's quiet, right? Never miss, a good never miss a good opportunity to be quiet when it's time to be quiet, but never miss a good opportunity to speak up when it's time to speak up. What do you think Paul was doing? <laughs> you don't have to ask me twice. Paul used this as an opportunity to do something, right? To be very quiet about the gospel. Mm -mm. He's going to lay it on these guys about the gospel. Then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand. That means he pulled out his wallet and started to share the gospel. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> then Paul stood up and beckoned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. Now, I'm not going to read this whole, what he said here, but what he's going to drive at, what do you think he's going to drive to? Sharing the gospel, right? We know this because look, pick it up in hmm, verse 27. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Who's the him? Christ. And though they found no cause of death in him, in Christ, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. Y'all know what he just did? He gave the gospel. He was crucified, he was buried, and he rose again, right? Uh, do you think these people are going to like this? Well, let's keep reading. And he goes on in verse 37. He says, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption, Christ. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers. And wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. What is the work? The finished work of Christ on the cross, right? They're not going to believe in him. Though a man declare it unto, him, unto them. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. That's good. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. I'm talking about the gospel. Is that good? Is it? Wouldn't you want that? That's an awesome thing. But when the, watch here now, trouble, target on your back. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting, that means saying other things than what Paul said, <laughs> contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Well, did they shrink from the trouble that they were going to, tr that they were going to, that they were facing here? Did they say, oh, I better be quiet and not say anything? No, it said, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God, talking about the gospel, should have first been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And he speaks a little bit more to him, but look at verse 50. It says, but the Jews... Oh, well, let me read verse 39, uh, 49. And the word of the Lord, talking about the gospel, was published throughout all the region. Well, that's good. But look at verse 50. But 
the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Remember now, Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, don't quit. Don't quit. You're going to face hardness. Don't quit. You're going to face affliction. Don't quit. You're going to face persecutions. Don't quit. Because let me tell you what we went through in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the driving point is driving. But it, we didn't quit. We didn't stop sharing the gospel. Nothing stopped us. He's wanting Timothy to have that same kind of resolute resolve there. Verse 51, but they shook the dust off their feet against them and came unto where? Iconium. This is what he was telling Timothy. The persecution, the affliction we went through at Antioch, now he's going to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Now watch chapter 14. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together. Who went both together? Barnabas and Saul, into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake. What, is, what does that mean? What do you think they were speaking? So speaking. The gospel. So spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But what if they had to quit? What if those Jews back in Antioch had to shut their mouth? What would have happened? You think people would have paid a price? Look at how many believed right here. So spake the gospel that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. That's Jews and Gentiles there. But the unbelieving Jews, trouble. Hey, whenever the light shines brightest, expect what? Bugs. Whenever you're given the gospel, expect resistance. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode Barnabas and Saul speaking boldly in the Lord. Doesn't look like they was going to shut their mouth, does it? Which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, the gospel, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. And part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was, I got these words circled in my Bible, and that when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully. What were these Jews and Gentiles, who were they going to assault? Paul, Saul, and Barnabas, right? <laughs> Look at the trouble they're going through. Just for giving the gospel message. Salt them to use them despitefully. That means they're going to rough them up real bad. Give them some black and blue, right? And to stone them. Oh, surely, surely Saul and Barnes will shut their mouth now, right? Too much trouble. It's not worth sharing the gospel. Look at all this trouble. I'm going, they're fixing to stone us. Verse 6, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra. Here's the third city, Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they never preached the gospel ever again. There is where they stopped opening their mouths. Sharon, it doesn't say that, does it? And there they... Preach the gospel. These boys were unstoppable in spite of the trouble. That's what Paul is trying to get his beloved son Timothy to see. You're going to go through trouble. But that's no excuse to shut your mouth. Don't let anything ever shut your mouth. Skip, skip to verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch. <laughs> hey, they got trouble following them. <laughs> They got trouble following him all the way back from Antioch. You'll be surprised when you give the gospel <laughs> how far trouble will follow you. It's always knocking at your door. And it will follow you <laughs> from a long ways off. They've come in all the way from Antioch. 
And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch, and look, Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, y'all, it don't get much worse than that, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. How be it? As the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Surely after all this, Paul and Saul and Barnabas are going to say, okay, <laughs> that's, that's enough to shut my mouth right there, right? You would think. But look at verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city. <laughs> Y'all, this fires me up right here. Because I, I go through trouble, and I, I need something to encourage me. I need to see other believers who are bold going through trouble, and it, it can't shut, stop their mouth. It can't shut their mouth. It's encouraging to me. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, watch this, y'all. This makes me full of joy. They returned again in reverse order back to the very same places that they had, gone, had suffered so much trouble. It said they returned again to Lystra, <laughs> to Iconium, and to Antioch. Watch this, though, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to what? What's the next word? To what? Continue. To continue. Hey, you're going to go through trouble if you're intentional about sharing the gospel. But look, continue. Continue to give the gospel. Despite of the trouble. He told him, continue in the faith that we must through just a little bit of trouble. No, it says through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Y'all, people that give the gospel need to know this. Young people that are learning how to give the gospel, you're going to go through trouble. But continue giving the gospel. God's grace will get you through it. It will. And souls will be saved out of it. We saw that over here where in, in Iconium, they didn't quit. And many of the Jews and Greeks believed because they didn't quit. So go back to 2 Timothy. i got to close this up. 2 Timothy. What do you think his driving message is to Timothy going to be? Here's what it is. He says, Timothy. You're going to go through hardness. You're going to go through trouble for the sake of the gospel. You're going to. He says, we did. I want you to know what we went through. He gave it there to the, him. I want you to know we went through persecutions and afflictions at Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra, chapter 3, verse 11 of 2 Timothy. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But watch what he says right here. But, what's the next word? Continue. 2 Timothy 3.14. But continue. Don't quit, Timothy. Don't quit. Satan's going to try to stop you. Don't quit. Trouble is going to come knocking at your door, following you. Don't quit. Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Don't quit. Y'all, you know something in the day and age we're living in now. It's getting worse and worse. Evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse today. And it's ramping up at a tremendous pace. But don't quit sharing the gospel. He told him don't quit. Chapter 4, really quickly. Look here, he says in verse 2, Preach the word, Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Not just the gospel, but sound doctrine too. And shall be turned unto fables. But look here, but watch thou in all things. Watch this little phrase right here, though. Endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Look what his very next phrase is. Do the work of an what? An evangelist. 
one who shares the gospel abroad. Don't let the afflictions you go through stop you from doing the work of an evangelist. That means sharing the gospel, folks. Make full proof of thy ministry. And then look what he says to Timothy. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. But Timothy, I want you to know something. I didn't quit. I was faithful to share the gospel. Nothing could stop my mouth. Look what he says. I have fought a good fight. Is it going to be a fight? You better bet your bottom dollar it's a fight. To share the gospel and, and to preach the word and to stick close to sound doctrine. It's going to be a fight. But he said, I finished my course. I finished it. I kept the faith. Timothy, I didn't quit. I didn't quit. I know I throw a lot at you tonight there, but I was just a little jacked up about it. I need encouragement sometimes. I go through trouble when I give the gospel. I do. It's followed me around. I get a bullseye on me. Anybody that's a fisherman does. And you, you uh, I'm going to use a word, a phrase you say, Trent. Do you pick up what I'm putting down? If, you, if, you, if you're sharing the gospel, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you pick up what I'm putting down. But people need to hear this. Believers need to be encouraged. Paul knew Timothy needed to be encouraged. That Paul went through trouble too, a lot of it, but he didn't quit. Don't quit sharing the gospel. Look up here. If you're listening uh, in the sound of our voice tonight, and I haven't stopped giving the gospel through all the trouble I've been through. And I don't intend on stopping it, but I would appreciate everybody's prayer for me. But if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, it's the most important decision of your whole life. Nothing else matters if you had not trusted Christ as your Savior. When you die, the thing that will be most important to you is that you know you have eternal life, that you know you're going to heaven when you die. Can you know that? Yes. Let me show you how. I'm going to let this hand represent you and me, and I'm going to let this wallet represent sin. Us, sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. Now, God loves sinners. He hates our sin, but he loves you and me, friend. He loves us. I'm going to let that hand represent God. God is a lot different than me and you. He doesn't have any sin. He's holy. He's righteous. He's sinless. Us, we're sinful. We're a lot different than him. And our sin separates us from a holy God. No matter how hard we try to get to God, we cannot get to God because there's a barrier between us and the holy God who loves us. Now, God don't want us to stay that way. He wants us to be connected to him. But sin messed everything up between us and a holy God who loved us. And because we've all sinned, we've got to pay a price tag for it. There's only one price tag for sin. It's death. It's only death, always death, nothing but death. The only thing that will ever pay for sin is death. It takes a death payment, nothing else but death. And all that means is we deserve to spend eternity forever in a place called hell. But God loves us. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He wants us to go to heaven to be with him. But to go to heaven, we have to be as perfect, as righteous as God. Heaven is perfect. God is perfect. There's no sin in heaven. We have to be perfect as him to go there. A lot of people have, have swallowed this lie, hook, line, and sinker, sinker. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. They think that God's got two sets of scales in heaven, putting all your good on one side and all your bad on the other. If your good outweighs your bad, you go to heaven. But if your bad outweighs your good, you go to hell. So they think, I've got to be good to go to heaven. No, you've got to be perfect to go to heaven. But the problem is, none of us are perfect. We're all busted with sin. And a lot of people think, if I just do a whole bunch of good deeds, it'll pay off my sin. It won't. It won't even help pay off your sin because it's not the right payment. Good deeds, not the right payment for sin. It takes death to pay for sin. You say, but if I go to church, won't that help pay for my sin? No. Is it death? No. Well, what about putting money in an offering plate? Will that help? What about turning over a new leaf? Will that do anything to pay for sin? No, because it's not death. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I don't care what work you name, it's not going to pay off any sin. All it does is cover your sin. You could have a million works, it's just going to cover it. It's not going to pay for it. We need it paid. That's what we need. 
Works will not pay it. It takes a death payment. Let this hand represent Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. Watch what he did. Jesus came down from his perfect heaven. He didn't have any sin. He did not have to die. We had the sin. But Jesus took all of your sin, all of my sin, off of us onto himself. Now, we don't have the sin. He does. And he died on the cross for, for you and me. He paid the price for our sin. He died. He'd rather die than live without you and me. And that's exactly what he did. He paid all our sins, so we don't have any left to pay. That's why the Bible says it's a gift. It's free. He paid the price. We don't have anything left to pay. And he was buried and he rose from the dead. He's in heaven today. He said, if you'll do one thing, because it's the only thing you can do to know you have eternal life. There's nothing else you can do. If you believe in Christ, that's the one thing. If you trust in him, rely on him. Put your faith in him. The moment you do that, God will give you as a free gift everlasting life. The very instant you place your faith in Christ. Where did the barrier go? It's gone forever. Now there's nothing that can keep you out of God's perfect heaven. You've got everlasting life. And if it's everlasting, there's only one place you can go, heaven. You can't know you're going to heaven until you know you can't go to hell. How can I know that I will never go to hell in the future? Because I did the one thing that guarantees me that. I can't go there. I've trusted Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here and you, in the sound of my voice and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, will you do it right now? There's nothing else you can do to be saved into eternal life. That's all you have. He died for you. He paid the sin debt. Why not trust the one who paid it for you? Right now, in the quietness of your mind, you don't have to move a muscle. God's not asking you to stop anything, start anything, join anything, turn from anything, give him anything. He's just asking you to do this one simple thing that you can do, that anybody in the whole world can do to have eternal life. Just believe in him right now. Will you do that? Friend, I know something. You can do that. You can handle that. Trust him and you can string along with me. I know I have eternal life.